Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you, guys. Hi. Thanks for sticking with us after an awesome session with Piper in City of the Sun. So welcome back. And now we have, as a continuance of that excellence of tradition, we have uh, four fabulous panelists here today. We're going to be covering the many ways of doing good, which I think is a great segue that not only overlaps with the earlier sessions that you've heard today, but also will hopefully offer you some new insights. In our prep calls, you know, one of the goals or some of the goals we've been trying to prep for you guys is not only how can we inspire the creative ideas and thinking that you see in the tagline for breaking out, but also how can we leave you with something that's tangible and tactical or strategic so you can actually act on those ideas, which is our hope for your takeaways today. So without further ado, I'd like to get started. And my name's Emily. I'm with the Case Foundation and happy to be with you here today. And so we're going to go through. Each uh, member is going to share a little bit about themselves. We've got some videos peppered in there. We've got some strategies and ideas to share. And then we're going to spend the last 15 to 20 minutes opening up the floor for some Q&A. So I hope you'll join us for that as well. So Denise, let's get started with you. So Denise is founder of Lava May, which we're going to hear about shortly. Uh, but I love in her description, she is a problem solver, which I think is a great title to have, a communications expert, and a great community advocate. So would you mind telling us a little bit about Lava May, and then we'll show a quick video? Yes. Thank you. So we basically are mobile hygiene for the homeless. We take decommissioned public transportation buses and gut them and turn them into bathrooms on wheels that we take out. We actually just launched our service in uh, June and are completing the end of our six-month pilot, which has gone incredibly well. We're out only three days a week, and we've given almost 1,000 showers to about 600 people now. And the results have been pretty amazing. Uh, people always ask, how did I get the idea for Lava May? A lot of it was homelessness has been an issue that I've cared about and has been on the radar for a long time. And um, one day through an event that happened, I actually did a little bit of research to find out about what the opportunities for getting clean were for the homeless in San Francisco. And what I found was appalling. There are about 16 shower stalls for the 3,500 plus people who live on the street, which is criminal. So um, between a fascination with mobile food, being a design junkie, and finding out that the um, local bus company was basically going to be retiring their decommissioned buses, Lava May was born. That's great. And I'd love for you to drill down just ever so slightly more, because I think a lot of us as change makers in the audience and perhaps watching at their desks, we try to sometimes boil the ocean or the problem itself, mm. like homelessness in this instance. It's such a big problem. And you sort of started to talk about how you drill down based on your set of experiences, based on the need and the research. Were there any other factors that helped you to just drill down into this one particular cause where you felt you could make an impact? Yes, so the issue of, of homelessness is incredibly complex. And solving that in a city like San Francisco, where housing uh, prices, where affordable housing is basically unavailable, trying to figure out how to solve the entirety of the problem was completely overwhelming. But when I found out about one very specific need that seemed instantly addressable by coming up with a very actually simple solution that repurposed something existing in the community, it seemed like an easy way to begin to put steps in place to sort of help people begin to transition. So we, we see ourselves as eliminating obstacles for people who are you know, applying for jobs and housing or who are trying to maintain health and well-being. So on our own, we aren't solving um, homelessness, but we're coming in as a piece of the puzzle that's missing to help people get more of a complete, comprehensive opportunity to move on. That's great. And can we see the video? And that'll give you a more well-rounded look at Lava May. My name is Hector. I have two uh, young boys. We are homeless. Most of us begin or end our day with a shower. We take for granted it's always there. But for the homeless, getting clean is a challenge. There's not many options you got. It's always on my mind. If I can't get into the shower because the list is long, I'll just ask for a towel and go to the bathroom. Going to the library and cleaning up a little bit. They don't like that too much. At night, you tell the kids when everybody's asleep, come on, go brush your teeth. There are 6,500 homeless people in the city of San Francisco, and almost half of them make the streets their home. Currently, only eight facilities in the entire city offer showers, each with one to two stalls at most. That's the challenges we've seen. If somebody takes more than 10 minutes, there are people lining up here now. 
That's about 16 showers for more than 3,000 people. Some people wait to take a shower because they really need to take one. And others, they'd be like, well, it's, it's been too long and it's time for me to go. You know, I'm gonna go. They ask, you know, we want to take a shower, Dad. You know, my, my response was, let me see what I can do. The United Nations and World Health Organization define access to sanitation and water as a basic human right. Yet many San Franciscans go without. When bathrooms and toilets are hard to access, illness, unemployment, and social isolation are hard to overcome. It really comes down to the basic fundamentals of what a person can live by being homeless. The bed bug situation in San Francisco is so ridiculous, people need to be able to shower. At Lava May, we believe everyone has a right to be clean. That's why we're launching a mobile shower and toilet service. The project that you guys are coming out is sounds exciting. Oh, that's a pretty good idea. A damn good idea, I should say. We're bringing together groups serving the homeless to get Lava May up and running so we can make the most of our resources, get the word out, get our buses on the road, and reach as many homeless San Franciscans as we can. But it won't be easy. We need your help. Public facilities, public toilets, public showers, things like that, they should be more accessible. I mean, so many things that a shower can do. The next time you shower, Think about the people who can't, and consider helping us make Lava May real. Let's begin delivering dignity one shower at a time. That was a great video. So hopefully that's starting to percolate some questions in your mind for Denise. Um, so we'll come back to you in a second. So Gina, I'd love to introduce you and your work with the SC Justice Group. Um, Gina is founder and executive director of the SC Justice Group, and not only that, but I am proud to say she's a 2014 Soros Fellow, an Echoing Green Fellow, um, and she's an award-winning social entrepreneur, attorney, and activist. So welcome, Gina. Mm -hmm. um, would you mind sharing a little bit, and, and who could I have asked for a better introduction than from Piper <laughs> about what you're going to talk about in a second? So if you haven't, you can flip to her bio really quickly um, for Gina Clayton. So would you mind sharing a little bit about what drove you to start SC? And I know you're in pilot phase right now, so we'd love to hear a little bit about that wrapped in with your experience. Sure. So um, we are, we're brand new. I'm building a loving and powerful community of women with incarcerated loved ones. So when I was a 1L, in other words, in law school or law terms, that means a first year law student, um, confused and scared and bewildered by all the classes and um, all the people who I thought were smarter than me. <laughs> I am um, someone who I loved. I was, I was a student at Harvard, and someone who I loved back in California was, being, was faced with um, some very serious criminal charges. Um, I remember going after class home to write letters to the judge, to make phone calls, to try and do whatever I could to appeal for leniency, um, and, and realizing that I had little to no power, despite the fact that I was walking on a campus with um, professors who had cell phone numbers of President Obama and all the major judges in this country, I still could do nothing. Um, he ended up uh, uh, being sentenced to a 20-year sentence and is serving that today. I left law school and went to a um, public defense office where I built a housing practice, actually not too far from here, at the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. And my work was to, uh, to represent women who were being evicted from public or subsidized housing as a result of some sort of criminal matter. So my clients look like women who, um, I'll remember one of them very clearly, uh, who was a, she was a grandmother, she lived in her apartment for 20 years, and her grandson was arrested blocks away from her apartment. He didn't live there, but when the police asked him his address, he gave, her, he gave them hers, because that was his stability. That was what he felt like was home in that time of confusion and crisis. He thought of her. So he told the police her address and based on nothing more than that one statement by that one scared teenage kid to his arresting officer, she spent six months fighting for her apartment, fighting to keep her home. And it was the city, the city of New York, <laughs> that was, um, strangely enough, 
trying to kick her out. She was paying her rent on time. She had never had a problem in the past. And luckily, because she actually had an attorney, which is rare, um, we were able to fight that case. And we able, were able to preserve the housing. But what I remember about that case and so many others, and that hers was representative of all of the other women that I represented in Harlem, um, was not the end, but it was the beginning. I was sitting, that, sitting across from her at that small table in that public defense office, and hearing her ask me one question, how much time do you think that you can give me before I have to move out? And that broke my heart. Because here was this, the backbone of a community, of a family. Here was the stability that we all needed to, ha to be in place, to, be, to, have, to have a home and be stable and be able to provide for her family and be the encouragement that her children and grandchildren needed her to be. And she was under attack. So I left that experience wanting to build something bigger and thinking that the answer was with women like her. What if we could unite all women with incarcerated loved ones? We have a major incarceration problem in the United States, which we all heard about. Two million people are behind bars. Seven million under, are under some form of criminal justice system control. Ninety percent are men. What that's doing is it is creating a hemorrhaging of men into the criminal justice system and spitting them out in, in forms that are not helpful to family functioning, is not helpful to bringing in money, and it's leaving a tremendous burden on black and brown and poor women to be everything. So what if we support those women? And that's, that's where Essie comes. What we have built is a curriculum built by women with incarcerated loved ones from across the country where we focus on trauma healing, managing money through crisis and advocacy, and we meet women where they are. And we're working to build an infrastructure, something like the Mothers Against Drunk Driving, but for mass incarceration. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so I, I'm guessing, I'm placing a bet that some of the folks in the audience here might be curious to know about your strategies or maybe what you're piloting. You know, Piper set it up really nicely in that a lot of these women in particular, because of the 90% of men incarcerated currently, and the women, children, the families, and other loved ones that are still in the communities and active there, you know, how can you give a face or this mosaic of champions that Piper set up that you need from the community level to, you know, be your activists on the ground to help with these causes? So for the folks in the audience here, you know, in your case in particular, you've identified and sort of, um, sort of translated some of the feelings from this group as stigmatization, isolation. So how do you match the two? How do you give people who are often feeling stigmatized or isolated a voice or the power to be the face of an issue? Mm -hmm. We start by honoring them and loving them and, and recognizing their importance in family and community. And so the way that we do that, people are asking, <laughs> how are you going to get these women? And my answer before I really figured it out was, well, they're everywhere. I'll just knock on doors, <laughs> which I always knew was kind of BS. But I, I needed you know, <laughs> people to go with me on this. Um, but then I came up with something. It was when I, I, I was visiting with a, a member of my program team, San Quentin, and these these guys, it was a part of a program, and, and the you know, volunteers were mixed in with um, men who were incarcerated. And they, they came, kept coming up to me and saying, Gina, I need you to remember the name Shanice because she is my daughter, and she needs to be connected with y'all. And I can't write that down, but I just need you to remember her name because she's amazing and blah, blah, blah. I need you to connect. And I, it dawned on us, and it kept happening, and it was completely moving and heartbreaking to hear you know, the love and how badly they wanted for their, the women who were loving them so hard from outside in um, needed a community to go to. And so we thought, well, what if we collect nominations and people were nominated to our program? So immediately on first uh, touch with us, we're saying, we, we see what you're doing, and we appreciate you. We're not here to judge you. We're not here to stigmatize you. We're not here to ask you, what was he locked up for? We're coming with love and appreciation. And so I get, I get letters. Now my job, this is the, the, the hard and the amazing part of my work, is I get these, these letters from incarcerated people um, and community members writing the most beautiful things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm nominating my daughter. She's a 34-year-old young single mother of two children, a daughter that is 11 years old and a son that is 10. He has sickle cell. He's always sick. I'm incarcerated, and she dropped out of college because she was raped, and she couldn't handle the workload and the kids and, the, and her sickness. 
After a few years, however, she got up enough energy to go back to school, and now she has a degree working on and working on another one. She's doing all this while helping everyone she can. And she's always, her heart is always so open. I don't think there is not one young person that would do more for, for their friends and family and whoever, else needs, and whoever else needs for help. Now this is what makes her a very special person. So these, these accounts, that's what puts the face mm -hmm. on, on the issue. That's how we create that pers you know, those personalities. So it's not just two million people. It's, it's this individual who has a family, who has a woman who's trying so hard despite this difficult situation. And so what we're trying to do is figure out how we can tell those stories. Um, but we're, you know, we're putting together a team and we're, we're hoping that, that we can craft a strategy on how to do that right now. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. um, and so cool, you know, it's a, it's a different topic, <laughs> but just as important, perhaps not quite as, you know, um, you know in the same area as what uh, Gina's working on. But for you, personalization, we were just chatting back in the green room, you know, um, Cole, who I'm going to introduce shortly more formally, but the products that he's wearing right now are part of his company and all signed by the women who made them in developing countries. So Cole is CEO and co-founder of a great organization called Crochet Kids International. Um, they're a nonprofit lifestyle brand, basically empowering workers and offering these great products to consumers who want to do good. Um, so we'll have a video as well to sort of match with what you're saying, but would you mind telling us a little bit about Crochet Kids and the work you're doing? I would love to. <laughs> Why, thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, again, thank you uh, to Neo Philanthropy as well, or Neo Difference, uh, for having me. Really glad, and this is an amazing panel, amazing event. So a little bit more about Crochet Kids International. We exist to empower people to rise above poverty. We do that in, through our work in Uganda and Peru by providing a holistic approach to poverty alleviation, one which includes jobs, education, and mentorship, with the ultimate goal of our work that we would actually graduate women out of our programs into locally sustainable careers. We started because we were traveling while in college, offering whatever way we could to help with our summer breaks, our time, our strength, our or whatever, whatever we could give, we were giving. And we, we came across uh, a community in northern Uganda, 20 years civil war, all this, all just a terrible history of rebel violence and all these things. And we asked women there what we could do to help them. And seven, eight years ago, our response expecting to be more money, more food, more things, they said, we want to work. We want to provide for ourselves. We want to be the masters of our own destiny. We want to set example for our children. And that was something we wanted to get behind. That was an idea. And that was, that was at that point for us, that's what it meant to be rethinking philanthropy and just something needed to change. And so this is a whole other story, but we knew how to crochet. <laughs> so we went back and we taught 10 women in Uganda how to crochet. Uh, excuse me, crochet, and this start off this it started off this whole brand as it is today. We wanted to do things a little bit differently in two regards. One, in that the product would help fund the work that we do. So today, over 85% of our entire operating budget is funded through the sale of our products. Places like Nordstrom and Urban Outfitters and Whole Foods are all retailers on our account, um, and we also distribute globally as well. Um, but the other thing is, to, to your point, Emily, is that the, the bigger thing and impact that we've seen here domestically is for somebody to understand and put a face to and a name and a story and dreams to these issues of poverty and what it means to support or to change that in, in one small capacity, and that's through a product purchase. So we have the profiles of all of those women on our website. So when you purchase a Crochet Kids item, you get to go and learn more about that specific person. And not only kind of open up the gates on transparency and apparel production, but also on what impact is really all about and what it means for an individual. That's great. And one of the unique things that separates you from the other panelists is that Crochet Kids is now in its seventh year as a nonprofit, right? Yeah. So, so I think for some of the folks in the audience here, it might be interesting because there are some funders or some partners 
who may like to partner on a longer term horizon or say, you know, once we're in, we're with you for the long haul versus mm -hmm. others whose style might be, you know, we want you to re-up every year. And so every year come to us with something new, an idea, something you need from us, et cetera. How can we be uniquely suited to help you? So for you all, over the course of the seven years, how, if anything, maybe there's some nuggets of how your relationships with either funders or other partners, uh, maybe it's the retailers you've been working with, how has that sort of changed and what, what would you want to tell them now looking back? Yeah, and I think we were talking a little bit uh, at our table earlier and just understanding for us it was a matter of, of that evolution of where that funding came from. And, and we, you know, we had the opportunity to take a lot of the brunt the very front of the work on ourselves and saying we literally to fund the initial aspects of our work we were crocheting our own beanies and selling them to friends in the northwest or at our universities and and that obviously served a time and a place and a purpose um, it's it's been really interesting because I think that initially as our approach to foundations um, you know we started some conversations there not a lot of fruit was bared through that and it was maybe proof of concept it was maybe us not being able to quantify our impact we said we want to graduate women out of our program and the immediate question is how many women have you graduated to which our response was zero <laughs> at this point it takes time you know um, it, it's a three to five year program and so it's it's been really interesting to get to the most recent point where we're actually both in a business model and our understanding around how we can sustainably fund our work and then our understanding of how foundations can uh, work with us not only on the granting level but on the on the impact investing level and it's it's really those paths have kind of been coming together at the same time to the point where there's conferences like this one that we're at today where there's a really nuanced conversation around how can we do this differently um, and I can share a little bit more later, and I have plenty of thoughts around it, but it's been really interesting to see those conversations, even with specific foundations, transfer over time to, to more better, like in a better way, accommodate uh, hybrid groups like we are. Sounds like it's a learning process for both the nonprofit partner and the funder. <laughs> Absolutely. Both have to meet but that's middle. what's fun about it, yeah. right? Because yeah. the, the end result is something that. Is, is what you can keep as the focus and what ultimately matters. That's great. Well, why don't we show the video oh, clip yeah, now? Please. And I think that'll give a nice, well-rounded story to your description. Yeah. It started with an idea, a simple act in response to a call for help. It started by listening, because everyone has a voice. Because we all deserve dignity. Because people are willing and capable. Empowerment requires much more than a single transaction or temporary assistance. An opportunity to flourish does not start with a handout. It starts with a job. Work provides worth. Education breeds innovation. Mentorship nourishes relationship. It's about investing in the whole person because people are worth it. Because everyone has a dream for their future. What would the world look like if we viewed the success of others as our own? What if you could equip someone to not just survive, but thrive? What if you could play a role in this process?
What if you could know who made your product? And what if their life would never be the same because of it? This is empowerment. That was a beautiful video. Um, and one thing, because I've, I've watched the videos a couple times before we, we went on stage in preparation, but you guys both, uh, whoever decided to make the video, both decided to use the word dignity hmm. in both videos. And it just reminds me, because so often that isn't a metric or a guideline or something that we're looking for as a funder or as a, you know maybe an organization or a partner. But yet it's so critical to both of your missions and the citizens you serve. So maybe you guys can noodle on that. And if something pops up, in your mind that you want to comment on, please add it. Yeah. Uh, but let's let's move forward to Komal. So we're so happy to have her here from the Bay Area. And she is the founder of a group called Feeding Forward. And she also is sort of an expert, if you will, on food waste management and learning how to translate uh, excess foodstuffs and other resources to those who need it. So would you mind sharing a little bit about some of the work you're doing with Feeding Forward and the online technology angle? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, so, it was probably in 2011, I had just come back from my last deployment, and uh, I went to school at UC Berkeley, so in the Bay Area, and I was on my way to get some lunch, and there was this guy on the sidewalk, and he had a sign up, and he said, like, ex-vet, um, hungry, anything counts, or something to that effect. And, you know, he stopped me, he said, hey, like, can you give me money? And I was like, no, no, but I'll feed you. And he's like, okay, like, sure. And so I actually sat and I had lunch with him and he told me a story and he was 26. He had just come back from, he had already done two deployments in um, Afghanistan and one in Iraq and he had just come back. And he was now living in our park and literally on the streets begging for food. And I think that no matter what anyone thinks about the war, diplomacy or whatever, but these are people who give the biggest sacrifice. Our veterans are the biggest people who give a, such a huge selfless sacrifice for their country, and then they come back and their country kind of turned their back on them. At least that's the way it seemed. And so um, I was just going to commission as an officer in the Navy. And one thing, I mean, he kind of showed me the place, the park that he, he lives in. And that's right across the street from our largest dining hall um, on campus. And it's also in the same place where a lot of that food at that time went to waste. And so I had asked you know, one of the chefs, like, hey, what do you guys do with all that excess food? And they said, we throw it away. And I said, well, why would you do that? You're literally right across the street from our largest like homeless sanctuary here. They're like, oh, because of liability, we can't, we can't donate it. And that's, everyone says that standard. And I said, this is so ridiculous. These are like homeless people. It's not like they have attorneys on their side that they're going to sue you right off the bat because you, you, know, you fed them. Um, and so I went online that night, and I, I kind of just looked up like food waste liability. or, And I found this act, and it's, a, it's actually a federal, a federal act that was passed in 1996 by President Clinton called the Good Samaritan Act. And it protects any donor from uh, any liability as long as they practice due diligence and avoid mass gross negligence. And you know, I brought that to our dining hall. Like I went straight to the executive director, because one thing I've noticed is if you talk to anyone in the middle, they'll always say no, or they'll always discourage you. So it goes straight to the top. And so I went straight to the top, and literally within three minutes, he was like, yeah, sure, let's pilot this. And so Berkeley became the first food recovery college campus in, in the country. And then I partnered with uh, a few other students from across, across the country uh, via Facebook. So, um, and we created this nonprofit called Food Recovery Network. And now we're on, I believe, 112 plus college campuses nationally. And essentially, it's just a, a student-powered food recovery movement. So we, you know, we take food from our, our games, our catered events, our dining halls, and then just redistribute it to you know, homeless shelters and other agencies nearby. Um, and it, it was great. We've done a lot. We, we've fed a lot of people. Um, but I think through that process, I really realized how many inefficiencies there are even in that model. And it was, uh, it was a particular day that I had gotten a call and I was in class. And you know, the dining hall manager was like, hey, you know, we have 500 sandwiches. They need to be picked up within the next two hours. I'm like, awesome. Now I have to like, go find a car you know, and then go to the dining hall and pack everything in. And, uh, load it all up, and that, and that whole process takes, you know, like 35, 40 minutes. And then I went through the list of all the agencies we had in the Bay Area that are, like, nearby. And, you know, a third of them didn't answer the phone. A third of them were like, no, we're okay for today. And then the last third are like, yeah, you know, we could take 15 sandwiches, 10 sandwiches. 
I'm like, awesome. Like now I have 500, I mean, so I have 485 sandwiches, cool. And at that time, I mean, I was always, I was also a student. So I was like, you know, it shouldn't be this hard to do something good. It shouldn't be this hard to do something like right. And um, it was literally on the side of the road that I thought of the idea that, you know, how cool would it be if we could know in real time where the supply was and in real time where the demand was and we could clear this marketplace faster. And that's really where the idea of Feeding Forward was born. And kind of like Rose said earlier in, uh, earlier in the morning, I had zero desire to make this a company. There was no, there was just a really great idea that I, I thought was a really great idea. And, um, excuse me, and, um, and I just wanted it to exist in the world, mostly to make my life easier. But uh, then eventually I just realized like, how much of a difference it's made. And so, so far we've fed over 650,000 people in, throughout the Bay Area. And our platform launched um, last July. And so we're kind of just expanding throughout the Bay Area and then um, making some strategic partnerships to, to hopefully grow across the country. That's great. What an exciting story. Um, so, you know, when I was looking up the website, as you guys hopefully will go to, it's a dot com. Mm -hmm. So would you mind, because this came up in an earlier panel, so I'd love to sort of carry through the conversation. Um, you know, what sort of classification are you? Why did you choose that? And, and, you know, are you happy with that? Are you thinking that that's going to be the long term way you're going to operate as an organization? Yeah. So, I mean, it's really, it's a very interesting conversation to have with investors or anyone really, and they're like, the first question after they're like, uh, is it, what's the liability issue? Uh, you know, the second question is like, so how do you make money? And you know, inherently, when you first come up with something like this, like you're, at least for me, it was, I just want to do good. I didn't really think about like, how am I going to make this a, a profitable business? Um, it was in my, in my senior year of college, like I'm writing my thesis, like I have so many other things to think about besides like building a business model out of literally taking people's leftover food and feeding poor people with it, like essentially. And it sounds crude, but that's really what it was. And, and where do you find a business model in that? And so it took a while. Um, and I definitely, I mean, so inherently your first, my first gut reaction was to make it a, a nonprofit. And, and so I did file, I filed paperwork. And, you know, I think a year, maybe 11 months into it, I called the IRS after like the 10th time. And they're like, yeah, we're still in a backlog. Of, we're still processing 2013's applications. And this was, you know, in November of 2014, yeah, 2014. So, no, 2013, yeah, 2013. So that, that they're like, yeah, we're still processing uh, 2012 and early 2013 nonprofit applications. And so I'm like, this is, like, this is literally never gonna be anything. And so unless you're a 501c3, you can't accept donations and, uh, and people can't get tax write-offs from you. And so that really kind of pushed me into, I'm like I have no other option but to make it a for-profit. And then I decided to make a Delaware C Corporation because that's also uh, what most investors will invest in because that's what they're most familiar with, the legal infrastructure behind that. Uh, so that, I mean, so it was more circumstance that pushed me there. However, I do think just learning and being in the Valley, uh, how important it is to have those characteristics of being agile and, and, and not having money necessarily at first was really what propagated me to move forward because I think that also at that time had I had you know, this endless supply of money right off the bat, this is kind of a diversion, but if I had that endless supply of money right off the bat, I don't think I would have been as hungry or as strategic or as um, you know, thoughtful in every action and every dollar I did spend that came out of my own pocket. So I think that that also forces you, you know, to figure out, okay, with such a limited money spend, how can I make the most difference? And then also, how can I make it so that I'm not constantly begging? Like that's not my subject matter expertise, like going up to people and asking them for money. Like that's not why I got into this. And so how am I going to do it? How am I going to make this a self-sustaining business? And I think that that's one thing that a lot of nonprofits could learn from. And that's kind of what I wanted to incorporate in this, in this model, that you could still make money and you could still do really good in the world. And so it's just a triple bottom line business. Mm -hmm. That's great. Would you consider yourself a social entrepreneur? Um, I think, I mean, sure, I don't really know. I think, I'm, I think I'm just somebody who wants to do really good in the world. And so, and I just came up with an idea that I'm sure other people have thought of, uh, but I just acted on it, so. We're the better, we're, better off for it. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Yeah, well, so this is, oh, did you want to add something? So I was going to jump into your please, question about please. dignity and how that's not measured. Mm -hmm. But actually, I, you know, even though 
Cole and I are the ones who use it in our video, I think that actually every single one of us is touching on that because dignity is something that connects you, your humanity, is deeply tied to that. So having a way to earn a living, having a way to nourish your body, having a way to honor the people who are left behind in times of crisis, those are all aspects of dignity. And it is a really interesting sort of unmeasurable or anecdotally measurable value proposition that I think becomes really important when you're looking at what organizations, be they for profit or nonprofit, are trying to do as they move the needle and trying to make things better. That's great. Uh, is there a way that you all at Lava May have sort of taken that to heart and learned to translate that, whether that's through your communications, mm -hmm. your messaging, or maybe even your, your strategic operations? So what we're in the process right now of doing is launching um, something we sort of are copying NPR's story core from. Like Picasso said, good artists copy, great artists steal. Mm -hmm. So we're stealing the story core idea and calling it shower core. We're um, leveraging a new Adobe app called Adobe Voice because it's really, it's this interesting conundrum. Our guests feel completely overwhelmed by having a video camera in their face, but they will let us record their voices and then take their photos. So what Adobe Voice does is this really beautiful program that allows you to layer voice and images together to create these amazingly powerful stories. So now we've been out there for four months. We see a fair number of people on a really regular basis, and we're building relationships with them. So they're sitting down and telling us their stories, which we're capturing. So we're starting to create this archive that we can share with funders. Um, and then also just sort of keep in general the ideas like how is Lava May touching people from the guests that we serve to our volunteers who are having transformative experiences because you know, innate to the issue of homelessness is a huge level of myths that exist about who the homeless are. So if you come in and you volunteer, you find out, wow, they're not quite who I thought they were. Um, the same thing with um, just people passing by the street. They see our, it's the very visible 40-foot branded bus and they walk by and they're like, oh my god, I heard about that. This is so cool. Or they never heard about us and it's an opportunity to stop and have a conversation. So we're starting to capture all of that. And together it builds this archive about the human dignity and, that connects us all. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I would love, you know, you're, it's a, such a citizen-based, community-driven program and platform, and I'm guessing a lot of people in the audience, whether they fund it or they're a part of actually creating a program or whatnot, or a combination of both, they're actually looking for how to activate communities. Um, and homelessness is often a subject matter that either people don't want to talk about or maybe people think is too, you know, too talked about depending on the community that you're in, how are you leveraging not only the citizens but also partners to elevate the work that you do? Well, I think I had a huge advantage in the fact that I didn't know anything about homelessness when I started. So I knew that I had to get out there and build those partnerships. So it meant getting all the stakeholders at the table. So it meant everyone from local government. We have a huge champion in um, a gentleman named Bevan Defty, who's the czar of homelessness in the mayor's office in San Francisco. And he helped bring local government to the table. And then recognizing that, OK, we have this new and innovative idea. It's the new sexy, shiny thing. But long before us, there was great work being done in the field. And we wanted to be sure and honor and learn from you know, the organizations that were doing critical work uh, to address homelessness. So we brought them to the table. Um, I'm all about user-centric design. So we brought homeless people to the table. We had tons of conversations and focus groups to find out about what their needs were, what their wish list was around this shower bus we were creating. And then the other thing, too, is we wanted to be really thoughtful. I mean, even though we're sort of a pop-up service wherever we go, we're if, if impacting neighborhoods where we are. In San Francisco, I'm not so sure about New York, but in San Francisco, nimbyism, not in my backyard, is a huge thing. So we wanted to be able to have um, neighbors uh, aware of and weigh in on how we were operating. So I think just coming in and recognizing that from the get-go, I know that we were going to engage and invite people to sort of help shape what we were doing made all the difference in the world. That's great. And, and so I'm going to build off this, and Cole, I'm going to toss this one over to you. Uh, we were just talking about an oldie but a goodie book, uh, Let My People Go Surfing, and the founder of Patagonia's story and how he you know, created Patagonia and the value system that they hold. Um, and one of the interesting you know, nuggets that he has was the shift that I, I will fully admit we at the, the Case Foundations, when you're talking about target audiences, so often we're like, OK, X, Y, Z, oh, and consumers. 
And you know, we, we sort of drifted, and I think it was an unconscious, because we care so much about citizens at the center in terms of finding creative solutions uh, for social change. But we've shifted to this language of consumers are the target audience. It's no longer about citizens, per se, or a synonym thereof. It's consumers. So you coming from a nonprofit side, but also caring about the retail, and, and having clients and retail partners like a Nordstrom's, like an Urban Outfitters, like a Whole Foods, how are you guys at Crochet Kids balancing that where you are trying to help citizens in a very meaningful way, but there's this balance with looking at people as consumers and their retail purchase power or their ability to affect change as consumers? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think one of the things is that oftentimes when we set out to do good, we create a mission statement. And I think a danger with uh, certain groups is that we, we come so fascinated with just the mission statement with just what we need to do to accomplish that, that we forget about kind of the ancillary things that need to happen that could, that could really be a support of that. And so when we say we exist to empower people to rise above poverty, we realize that it really has kind of two, two vision statements. And one is which that we are implementing holistic care programs on the ground in the places where we work. But the other side of that is that we want to be empowering people here in the US and helping them understand about how they can play a role in this empowerment as well. That we need to focus on not only creating great product, but doing great marketing and, and sharing about all the work that we do in a manner. And sometimes it, it, it could have the potential that it looks like a distraction, that it's like, oh, we're doing the, like just last week, we were doing a photo shoot in Portland and we put together these videos that take time, effort, and energy, but all of those things can still fall under that mission, can still be the things that you really need to do to support your mission in even a better way. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's really an approach that we've taken, and I, and I think that book specifically uh, was something that's been so pivotal in our, it, was in our early stages and then moving forward. And, and it's that idea of, of changing the conversation around from how do I make sure this is the coolest looking hat ever and, and look at the competitors and see what they're doing and, and compete on that same level, both in taglines and photos and all that. You need to be relevant there, but you need to think about ways to engage people in that larger conversation. You need to, you need to be thinking about how if your mission statement and what you seek to accomplish doesn't fit in a four or five word tagline, then how, how are you creating the platform through which you can engage people on a product level, but as well those that want to go a little bit deeper in understanding uh, the work that you're doing, um, how, how the impact of their purchase is so much more. And, so I think it's really just a reframing of, of what it means to engage and interact with those people and a reframing of telling them that they're more than consumers, that they have more to offer and more that they can do this, with this world than just make themselves continually look fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> agreed, agreed. And on that, I, I love the last point you made about sort of the redefining of what is talent, what is the right audience, what mm -hmm. is the right advocate. So Gina and Komal, I'd love to hear from you all with your respective work. Have you guys, because of the issue area or because of the geography that you serve or whatever that, that factor may be, have you had or has it been beneficial or not to look at redefining who you're looking at as your champions, whether it be a college student to the executive director of the food service company who you might not expect as an ally in your work, to the women and the children and others in the communities who are affiliated with these incarcerated folks who may not expect to be your advocates or champions. How have you guys worked with that community and sort of tried to lift them up? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that is really inherent in, in our strategy is bridging movements. Um, I think, uh, you know, I realized that the anti-mass incarceration work that was going on, whenever we talk about women, or whenever we were talking about women, it was always incarcerated women. Because they're you know, in a very important and troublingly you know, growing uh, number, um, they're still a small percentage. And so we were always at, literally at the bottom of agenda. So I would see, you know, oh, now we get to talk about women all the way at the end of the day when everyone's tired. Um, and that, to me, didn't make any sense. And you move over to the women's rights work that's happening right now, which is, I think, some of the most exciting um, 
you know, conversations and activity among women today that have that has gone on at least in the last 10 years. I mean, it's just been extraordinary. Um, people are calling themselves feminists again and not being afraid. But that's women's women's rights advocates are not talking about the mass incarceration problem, even though it is the largest generator of of inequality and barriers in, this, in the United States in terms of an institution that's doing this. Um, and so we're really seeking to, to bridge that gap. Um, how can, you know, if you care about women and what's happening to women in this country, you should care about incarceration. Um, and if you care about incarceration problems hurting, you know, people and families, you need to look at women because it's hurting them too. And so for us, it's, it's really trying to take a new approach and engage new audiences in ways that, that haven't happened before. And we see that women, I mean, over and over again, are incredibly persuasive advocates. Um, so, you know, that bottom, I believe, what Piper said, that a system like this, an incarceration system that is so entrenched in kind of for-profit, you know, motivations and racism and, and patriarchy and all of these things that we despise, um, you know, ha it, for it to change, we really need a populist approach, one that engages communities. It's not just, you know, a few, you know, smart Ivy Leaguers coming together and saying, this is how we do it. No, it needs to engage communities and, and, the, and the answers are there. And so that's really what we're, you know, we're trying to do is to, is, to cre is to find ways to create that infrastructure for that to happen and for that to exist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a persuasive great. way. That's great. That's great. So I think that one other common theme besides dignity that runs through all of us is like empowerment. And so I had to empower quite a few different stakeholders in, in my whole process, um, whether it be, you know, like the CFO, the CSO, so, you know, the corporate supply officer or the, the chief financial officer, so many different people at so many different, like whether it's Wells Fargo or Google or whoever, what other company that we had to, I had to tell them, like, why this is important, like, what is the benefit for them? Why would they spend that extra two minutes to go onto, onto the phone and, and just post this, even though it's like a nominal amount of time? Um, and, and I had to figure out a way, why would they pay us? Why, why wouldn't they rather just throw it away? What are the incentives behind it? So I had to figure out all of those answers. And once I did, I was able to empower you know, that stakeholder. And then you have to empower nonprofits, which are inherently technologically behind. Um, and you know, they're also sometimes, a lot of the really well-established ones are also really resistant to change and resistant to like how technology has changed and moved us forward. So even from going online and signing up and, and registering your profile and your nonprofit and saying, hey, this is when we want to accept food, which is all together literally a two minute process, I mean, that can also be a little bit more difficult. Or, you know, to, to be able to, I mean, there's, there's so many different, like, um, and I'm sure we all have it too, is that there's so many different issues with every person that you have to, to empower and, and every audience you have to tailor your message to and every stakeholder you have to bring on. And I don't think that I had any idea when I was starting that there was going to be so many different uh, nuances and, and issues um, and joys in, in bringing all the different stakeholders. And then also making sure that the, that the end consumer still had this like experience that he, he, was receiving, he or she was receiving food with dignity. That it wasn't just like this half-bitten sandwich, but rather like very wholesome, very, um, you know, nutritious, you know, gourmet type of food. Um, and to be honest, 95% of the time they ate better than I did. And, you know, they, uh, the meals were, were given, you know, in, within health standards. And I mean, I think that that, making sure that the last person also got, they were the ones who were really, that, that I was working for. And so everything else was just the process. So it was really, I wanted to make sure that the last person, that was the stakeholder to me that mattered the most. And that was the audience to me that I wanted to appeal to the most. That's a very tweetable comment. <laughs> trying to work on that talk and tweets when you're out on stage that way. Things the to tweet. Easier time. Exactly. <laughs> Hashtag breaking out 14. Um, so Komal, that was great. And you sort of alluded to tech. I think you and, and as well as others on this panel, but in particular, I'd love to carry that theme through just because we are talking about the many ways to do good. So I'm going to poach a little bit from some of the other panels. So in talking about tech and your experiences, even, even making sure, for example, uh, you had dropped a comment earlier, making sure it's mobile friendly, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that your platform was uh, responsive. So are there sort of trends or sort of lessons learned in your experience working with technology? I know you're in the Bay Area, so maybe broadening it for the folks in this audience. 
what can you learn as either a partner of an organization trying to adopt new technologies or experiment or be fearless when it comes to integrating? Um, you know, how, what, what have you learned from that and what would you share with this audience as a tip or two? Sure, so I think that I think sometimes as entrepreneurs, we get so caught up in our idea and we get so enthused and so pumped that sometimes we also tend to live in our own like bubble. And I think that we also create technologies that we want to see in the world. And sorry, my bad. Uh, we create technologies that we want to see in the world and not necessarily technologies that are actually truly beneficial to the world. And so I think in terms of technology, like one of the one of the most important things is to build technology that people will actually use. And that seems like such a fundamental like, idea, but it's not necessarily something that I think all entrepreneurs, whether it's in the Valley or in the Bay or you know, here in New York or wherever else, that you know, we, we have to remember we're creating technology for someone else. And um, so I think that definitely iterating different types of versions for me was very important that whether it's like as seamless as possible for like an executive who's literally just wants to take a picture, post it and say, and be done with it. Um, to also then like you know the the organization and how the how the sign up process just has to be super super intuitive, and that's something that you have to constantly get feedback about and you have to remember that I mean it's a very lean startup model that you constantly you just put your first model out there and then you just tweak based on the feedback that you get and you have to always like you can never take any feedback personally. Well, you can take it personally in, in one sense, but not, not too personally, like as if you failed. It's just that's an opportunity to improve and, and to actually create that impact that you want to create. Mm -hmm. That's great. Can I jump in a minute um, around the idea of using technology? Because I think a lot of nonprofits, I mean, even in the corporate world, that's where I came out of. I mean, I worked in tech before I worked in nonprofits. And, um, you know, as a marketing person, which is my background, you get inundated with, oh, this is the new tool, and this is the latest and greatest thing. That's, okay, I'm jumping to Facebook now. I've added Twitter. Okay, Instagram, and then my Pinterest page is also supposed to tell my story. And unless you have one or two people who's handling that for you full time, forget it. You're sunk, right? So we just came off an Indiegogo campaign, and my campaign person at Indiegogo is amazing. It's like, okay, so I need you to do all of these things. I'm like, really? I'm actually trying to get out there and do showers. Yeah. So I think there's this a little bit that nonprofits face, you know, even if you're a new nonprofit, profit and embrace technology, like which are the best platforms to be using so that you're not caught in this time suck that actually doesn't really, you know, provide the ROI that you want, which is still a big mystery. Nobody's really figured out. I've got, you know, 10,000 Twitter followers, but what does that mean really in terms of like who's donating and supporting the organization or where does that lead me to volunteers or things like that? It's still kind of a huge question mark. Um, and I think one of the things that the, the tech panel talked about earlier was this idea of, you know, there's opportunity here for funding, for funders to come in and say, look, you know, here's a small organization that's doing a lot of grassroots work. Here's an organization that's really leveraging an online, creating online movements. How do we get them together to create more change, to move, to create movements, but jointly partnering? And it's something that I think that funders might be in a unique position to be able to like know about what the left hand and the right hand are doing and kind of bring them together to effectuate real, real change. Very and awesome. I'm going to jump in on the technology piece really quick, too, because I, I, I love the, how, you know, Crochet Kids wouldn't exist if we didn't have these channels to get to communicate uh, through Twitter and all these social media platforms. But an interesting new learning on our end recently is, has been leveraging technology when it comes to our monitoring and evaluation as well. So we collect all these data points for each individual woman who's a part of our program. We say we want to empower people and we have created a framework that we can measure that empowerment over time. And whereas that used to live in Excel spreadsheets and a handful of people looking at that, there is a data, there's lots of different options, but we use a data visualization tool called Tableau, which takes all of this, all of this uh, data that we've collected and brings it to life. So that we can see trends on a macro level or an individual level to say, we did a training, did it have the impact that we wanted it to have in the areas that it was, that it was supposed to? It was surrounding dietary uh, diversity of your diet. And are women in our programs, do they have an are they now, do they have a more diverse diet? And those types of things that allow you to really iterate and improve and innovate on every step um, and seeing that laid out in front of you, uh, and then sharing that with with partners as a nonprofit organization has been 
hugely important on the impact side as well. That's great. Um, and just keeping an eye on the time, I think in a couple minutes we'll break for questions, but I'd love to have everybody sort of weigh in if you'd like. Um, you know, so, so something on the mind of us at the Case Foundation is this idea that has been raised and percolating about being fearless, about failing forward, mm -hmm. about experimenting, making those big, hairy, audacious goals as funders in particular, because we realize the role of funders when it comes to helping nonprofits execute these big ideas. But for you all, I'd be curious to know, so you know, separating it from the funding conversation, which has come up a few times, what would you need, what would you want in a perfect or ideal world as you know, an organization with the various missions you all have? What would be that aha thing that would help you to achieve your goal in an exponential kind of way? And you, you can make it as tactical as you want or as broad as you want. I think it'd be really insightful for some of the folks in the audience to hear. I need a moment. Yeah, Let please, please. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll jump in and just say that I think I'm so encouraged by this community, right, that these conversations are happening. I think that maybe I was unaware of them and, and I didn't know, but I just see kind of this, this movement taking place, not only on the nonprofit or social good side, but on the funding side, and I'm really encouraged by that. And so if what I would love to see, what we need as an organization that's this very hybrid model that's, that's a brand and creating these products and selling them, but also needing funding capital to take those big steps. Um, I need more people like you <laughs> in more conversations, more conferences that are taking place like this. And then people to take risks, you know? We've talked, we talked a lot about that earlier as well when it comes to just starting trying if impact investing is something that you're interested in that can happen at at the at a varying degree of risk that you're willing to take but start building those relationships and start getting familiar with it because there's only going to be more and more organizations and people that are that are trying to creatively shake this up that are going to be the out of boxers um, that are going to be reimagining what what philanthropy will be and so the sooner that you guys can identify those relationships people that you can start to work with and understand how you can be comfortable the better off the nonprofit sector will be and your guys's role in that will be paramount so you know obviously money absolutely funding but i think you know as i um we provide services to a very vulnerable population and I, you know, we're going to be scaling fairly rapidly, and we hope to launch Lava May Global at the end of next year. Um, and I am a risk taker, definitely, but I also feel like I'm, I'm working with a very vulnerable population that I don't want to, you know, I w I'm willing to risk, but I don't want to just fall apart because people are now counting on mm -hmm. our service. Um, so what I would love to see fund funders do is if there could be some sort of a um, like a think tank incubator where there were models and mentorship from people who do everything from financial modeling. So if you take this path, X happens. There are all these sort of data experts out there that do really interesting modeling of different, um, I'm not even using the right language, but um, having that as a resource where I can plug in what I'm doing and I could see how my risk factors scale if I take this step or that step and to periodically have that as kind of a, a resource to help shape my decision making would be tremendous. Good idea. <laughs> so, um, so I think that foundations have a really important role to play in not just um, dis dispensing funds, although that's incredibly important, <laughs> but I think also educating um, others about what it means to be a nonprofit. Um, and what it means to do philanthropy and how to do it right, how to do it in a culturally sensitive way, how to do it in a way that's sensitive to understanding of what grassroots means and diversity. Um, there's a whole wave of new philanthropists that are coming. I'm also in the Bay Area, and I, I, I'm a little concerned sometimes with what I see and the mentality and the, and the um, in some ways, uh, perceived sophistication, but really, um, a little bit of arrogance, <laughs> if I can, if I can say that, um, in terms of the approach to what what it takes to make social change, it's not going to be an app that's going to solve poverty completely, right? And that's not a, that's not to denigrate technology. It's just to say that these issues are complicated, and and require experts. I think at a certain at, 
to, to play a part in, in helping to untangle things, as well as communities. And foundations, I think, um, can do a, a really good job of, of upholding kind of those values um, and helping young nonprofits to um, consider ways to do creative partnerships. I completely agree with what you had to say about, you know, finding, all right, well, there's this great organization that's doing this, but they don't have the resources to know what all else is out there, so let's, let's marry, you know, some, let's, you know, create some perfect unions, <laughs> be the matchmakers. Um, and then, secondly, I would say that for, you know, some, it was said earlier in the day, and I completely agree that uh, looking at young nonprofits, and perhaps this is a bit self-serving, but um, you know, young self nonprofits that are doing things in an innovative way and saying that we will partner with you for a period of time and and allow you to you know allow you to fail and expect that to happen and, and have a high standard. Um, but I think that that really allows for for all of us to be at our most creative and our at our best. Um, and be able to, to, do, to do good and make social change in the long run. Okay, okay so there's a lot uh, said there, that a lot of what I agree with, too. And I think that, well, multiple things. I think that your question was originally, like, how, what are the things that we need to expand, right, essentially? And I think that it's unfortunate, but I think a lot of the work that entrepreneurs or nonprofits or um, do is very redundant. We all do a piece of the pie, you know, so it's, yes, it's never going to be an app that completely eliminates hunger. Um, it's never going to be just a food bank. It's never going to be, we all do little pieces, and none of us really work together, whether you're a nonprofit or a for-profit. And I think that really what's going to make long-term change for all of our organizations is if we make these partnerships, and that means, like, not just with, like, Salvation Armies and, and uh, but also with for-profit companies. So for me, like, what would be a really great way to like, expand would be to partner for Uber because with, like, we are, that is what Feeding Forward is. It's Uber for food recovery, right? So it is on-demand food recovery. And so, you know, figuring out how do we go into their, like, a for-profit company's corporate strategy and um, see how, like, they can then demonstrate corporate social responsibility through, like, you know, being on-demand drivers. So whenever they don't actually, aren't actually picking up someone, they're, they're just picking up and dropping off food and they can get a tax write-off for that. And there's so many different incentives you can build in. So I don't necessarily think that foundations are the only solution or nonprofits are the only solution. I think that, in fact, for-profit companies and um, huge corporations are, are people that I think entrepreneurs, and especially social entrepreneurs, have a lot to learn from because they've already built these self-sufficient, well-oiled businesses. And I think that we, get, we have a lot to gain from that. Um, and, and also, I think that that is also what helps build self-sustainability. And that's ultimately what I would need to to expand, I think, nationally and, uh, and globally as well. That's great. And we should also have the federal government too, right? Oh, yeah. Our CEO, well, so, you know, to solve these problems, right? <laughs> yes. it's our CEO, Gene Kay, she always says, all ores in the water. I mean, that's the right. only way any of this is going to get solved. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as the social sector, shouldn't we all be moving forward to those big, hairy, audacious goals to put ourselves out of business? Yes. You know, at the end, wouldn't it be great to solve malaria? Wouldn't it be great? So, et cetera, et cetera. So, just one more thing to that point. Sure. Um, you know, you look at the for profit sector, and MA is the way things are done. But there are very few, almost no mergers and acquisitions that happen between nonprofits. And I think foundations, funders sit at a really in interesting intersection to be able to see, wow, these two organizations have very similar visions, that very similar ways of operating. Maybe we bring them to the table to look at how do we actually combine what they're doing to make them bigger, better, stronger, um, and that doesn't really happen. That's great. The Voltron of nonprofits, <laughs> right? <laughs> For those who remember that cartoon. Um, so let's open it up to some questions. I think you've got four amazing panelists here today who are happy to share some of their insights and knowledge. Are there any questions or thoughts that anybody would like to share? Please, right there. Oh, I think there's a microphone coming your way. Thank you. <laughs> Curious whether or not you knew each other before you came to this conference, and have you ever actually, you know, and would you now go back and consider some sort of, uh, you know, collaboration or cooperation, especially those in the Bay Area? And you really, and until the very end, you, none of you really did talk about the the role of government service, government, um, I mean, government revenues in all this. Yeah. And you're in a big city that's a very progressive city. You know, have you worked at all with trying to figure out how to ensure that their resources are better used? and that they're part of what you're trying to do. So um, Rose and I, who's on hand up, um, we are both 
uh, from, we actually are in the same circles. I was with her when she sort of began Hand Up. I signed up her first few um, clients. So we have a, a working relationship in that sense. We send each other opportunities and press inquiries and things like that. Um, I had never met Gina before, so this is a first. And I think you know there are sort of interesting ways. When we were talking about sometimes even working with someone from outside of the sector that you serve just gives you a new lens because you can get that force for the trees kind of thing. And so you know there's definitely opportunities I think to just sit around and think, this is the problem I'm facing. What's your perspective on this? Even if you're dealing with totally different issues, in terms of government. Um, we are very tied to local government in the sense that we partner with the Public Utilities Commission, the Department of Public Health, the Department of Public Works. They basically provide all of our permitting and access to water and gray water disposal and things like that. Um, we are also very deliberate about not accepting government funding um, for multiple reasons. Um, one of the biggest one being the fact that the reporting process is so labor intensive that I would have to hire a person just to manage you know, those funds, and it's just not, not worth it to me. So can I just piggyback? Um, so we're definitely going to get drinks when we go back <laughs> uh, to San Francisco and the Bay Area people need to get together. But that's what this is great, you know, to do is to start to build those partnerships because we don't, we don't really, we stay in silos uh, too much of the time because um, there's so much work to do. But in terms of government partnerships, there's, um, this is one of those things where we're always trying to find alliances. And for, for the work that I do, um, reentry is a really big, um, kind of key point because all of the people who are incarcerated, unless you are, you know, have a life sentence, and even then, but or you're on death row, you're coming out. And if you come out, most likely you're going to a woman. And so if we can talk about, you know, reentry in terms of equipping women to be able to, you know, be better um, prepared for what that's going to be like, and to be able to play a role in helping that person reintegrate successfully, um, then I think we position ourselves well for uh, government collaborations. Um, but that's one of those things that you know, we're always kind of looking for. How can we align ourselves with whoever, it really doesn't matter who, but whoever is also interested and in, invested in kind of the outcomes that we want to see take place um, and better prepare ourselves to build those partnerships. That's great, thank you. I think there's one more question right there. Yeah, hi. I'd be really curious, um, you guys are all really extraordinary entrepreneurs. What do you need to get out of your way in order to be successful? I think ultimately... Go, no, go for it. Okay, I think ultimately... I mean, yeah, it's a very standard entrepreneur answer, but I think ultimately, like, even that, that capital to just, like, for, for all these, like, daily problems, whether it's, like, hiring a really talented engineer or like a back-end developer, whatever, to not be in your way. Like these like ridiculous problems to not get in the way of you solving an even more ridiculous problem, right? And, and for me, I'm solving one of the world's largest ridiculous problems ever. So really, I, I, don't, I think that money can sometimes create a lot of uh, things that, that may impede in my way. Um, I think that I'm fortunate that mostly everyone I meet, even if they have zero knowledge about this space, um, and they personally can't do anything, they'll always know someone who does, who could, or who, who would know better. And I think that's the extraordinary thing about the people that I meet and that I interact with. And I'm sure there's many of those people in this room too that maybe have zero idea that like hunger was even an issue or that one in six Americans don't know where their next meal is coming from, um, but that they're willing to help. And uh, ultimately, what was your question? Not <laughs> to get out of the way. <laughs> now that I went on that tangent. <laughs> What do you need to get out of your way? Yeah, some money, essentially, to, to not be that, to, to, for that to not be an issue, I think. You know, I think the first thing that comes to mind, that's a really good question. I think one of the first things for me is like, I think I, I need to get out of the way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I need to, I need to re remove myself from like being the hero in all of it. And I, that can come in a lot of different forms. Obviously, a great staff obviously a great board of directors, obviously great partnerships, but um, that's, that's a thing that any entrepreneur as you start and you just heap more and more on your own shoulders and, and you're the one that needs to, that, to do all these different activities because you know how to do it best and, and you were there since the beginning. Um, that's just a constant evolution from personally, I can speak to that. And I think it's beautiful because I think ultimately what I love and, and what I'm encouraged by are the, the people and the groups 
in the leaders that have been able to leave whatever they've done and and to say that the best thing that they ever set up was like was the was the brand was the company was the structure that they left behind them and it wasn't necessarily like the stamp that they personally put on every department or field or what have you so trying to trying to kick myself out of the way <laughs> um, for me uh we are looking at developing an earned income stream that's based on advertising, right? We have these 40-foot buses, and we can do static advertising, but that, you know, with four buses, you know, we could probably generate between two to $4,000 a month, which would be great. But my vision is to go digital, and to create digital content, and San Francisco has an ordinance against new digital content. So I need the city to say yes, give me an exemption so we can create digital content, because if we can do that, we can not only fully fund ourselves, we can see this effort in other cities around the country. Um, can I say email? No. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like email Word. takes over my days. Um, but let's yeah. see. <laughs> but I think for me, as a, as really new to this, um, I I hit kind of a barrier. There's really a barrier to entry when it comes to funding. Um, the foundations all loom really large, and then there, I learned that there are ones that are like fancier than other ones, and they're like the little ones, and the ones that are like, whoa, it would be really great to get. You know, I don't know. It just seems like a whole hierarchy in the space that I had no idea existed, and um, and I just and I. And I feel like if there was a funder fair or something that could make sense of it all, speed I could dating. just go. Speed dating, speed dating, exactly. <laughs> investor dating. Just something to, you know. And at the end, they write a check. Right. right. And, like, and all of it has to be solicited. And I don't know how to be solicited. If I, like, do I just jump up and down a lot of times? And, like, yeah. you know, it, there's just, it just seems to be really confusing and about knowing the right people, which at, at the end of the day, it makes me, it makes me, a little bit sad because I think about the women in my program and they would never ever be able to start a group like this and get funded to do it nationally because they don't have that they have full-time jobs I was able to go couch surfing which by the way is also something you can only do if you look a certain way and have the right color skin and talk a certain way but I was able to do that for a year and sleep on other people's couches so that I could bootstrap this organization um, it makes me sad that there are all these barriers to entry which are, is inhibiting people from communities um, who know how to you know, solve problems from being able to do so because they just can't get a solicited you know, ask from a major foundation. Just, it just isn't set up for that. Mm -hmm. A lot to think about. <laughs> there you go. I think we have time for one question, one more, right there in the back. I think that'll be it for us. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is about, and this might be easiest for Gina to answer and hardest, for, harder for the others, but. Try us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just because it, it, one thing I notice is you all are at various points in terms of relationship to the people you serve, and some of you are face to face with them, and some of you are further away from them. How do you, and, and one thing that struck me was just watching the videos. I, I, I'm an attorney, I work with uh, sex workers in New York City, and we are very careful about how we use our clients' images and our clients' stories in order to sort of you know, sell our project. Um, but you have to do it in some way, <laughs> because otherwise, how do you communicate what it is that you do in a way that inspires people to invest in you or, or give to you? Um, how do you structure in accountability around that, uh, around your marketing and around, just in general, your program? How do you structure in accountability where the people who you're providing services to have some control and some leadership over what you're doing? Yeah. Um, so this is a really good question, something we're actually dealing with internally right now. So you've just like gone inside my brain. <laughs> um, scary. Um, I, our very first program, so we were contacted by a documentary filmmaker who wanted to do you know, a kind of a long-term piece on the work. And um, she wanted to come for the very first session. And we were like, okay, well, sure, you know, you can come. And she wasn't necessarily going to take any footage, but we were going to kind of see how it was going to go. And, um, and it became clear right away that was not going to happen. You know, women were like, I'm, a, you know, I'm an abusive relationship. I'm afraid that I might lose my job. I mean, it just, there was no way that that was going to happen. Plus, we meet women when they are um, not in their activist place. 
And that's what I think makes us different. Because you have a lot of organizations that are there for when you're ready to go, when you're mad. I want to get, I want to get angry. I want to go find somebody, get serious about this issue. We engage women when they're like, oh, I can't, I don't know what to do. I can't do it anymore. And that's when we bring them in. We love them. We deal with the trauma stuff. And then slowly but surely, actually quick, quicker than I thought, by session three, in fact, women are already saying, we want to reclaim our stories. We want to be out there. Where's the mic? Can we get a, can we do this on the camera phone? And I think that's the, that's the thing. Allowing for that process to happen has been for us so far um, what, what it's been about. And then saying that this is your story to tell so that we're not going to do it, but you, know, you tell us how you want to represent the issues in yourselves and provide mediums for that to happen. Yeah, and I would just add, I think it's really about approach. So early on when we, when we had been traveling internationally, we've all grown up knowing and seeing videos uh, and TV commercials of poverty and, and there's, always, there's too often one picture of what that was about. It was the hungry child, um, the destitute mother, and we simply didn't meet those people when we, when we had been in countries, yeah, there was great poverty, but there is so much hope and resilience and joy and so many sides of the story that weren't being told. And so through all of our marketing, our, our hope is that we're telling a story that and approaching it in a way that those women, that honors those women that we work with and that shines a light on like the future and the capability and what they're able to provide for themselves and their families. And I think it's just a context thing that and a, a decision that you have to make as to how you go about that. Um, that's been our approach is that any one of the women that have got to see you, the videos that we've done is like, it's we're about empowerment and they get, to, they get to be a shining example of that in a really positive light. So I guess kind of to end that off, um, we also, accountability is super important to us. So when someone posts to our platform and requests a pickup um, and we you know, match it to an on-demand driver, and that driver then you know, retrieves that food and drops it off at that organization. It's that organization's responsibility to then you know, take a few pictures of the people that were actually fed by that, by that food donation, by that surplus. And then those photos are then set back to the donor. So the donor, I mean, that's one of the most important parts, that the donor gets to see like, the impact that they made by spending two minutes of their time feeding forward and, and see the real faces behind it. And actually, like, for me, yeah, like I, it, it could sound like we're objectifying these people, but not at all. I mean, these are people all who have given their consent. And it's also like these organizations that are, you know, they're taking the onus on it, that they need food. And, and they also need to show people that like, hey, this is actually going somewhere. This isn't just like, I'm not putting this in my, like the, the trunk of my car and leaving it there. It's like actually going into people's stomachs. And that is like the number one way to continuously build that, that relationship. Um, and that accountability structure is to show the impact to, to everyday people that are actually posting to our platform. Did you want to add anything, Denise, before we? Um, you know, I think if you, you, our very first video, which was the one that was shown today, was, um, it's now almost a year and a half old. Um, Hector is the homeless father. And um, we, we basically show the footage to anyone who's participating. I mean, they sign releases. But before we release it, we share it with them for impact input. Um, and he was delighted, but um, a year in June, when we actually had our official launch, he was at our event, um, and he's now housed, and his children are doing really well. But um, he basically, everybody who was there was like, oh my god, you're Hector, this is so great. He goes, oh, people in Washington, D.C. know who I am, because I was in that <laughs> video. He, he loves it. So we just try and be very conscious of the fact these are human beings feelings and emotions, and that they have an opportunity to weigh in on what we produce before we release it. All right, that's great. So I think that brings our time to an end. So please join me in a round of applause for both Neo and for our four panelists. Thank you.